first of all, remember, knowledge about the patterns of word trade. So let's look at the figure. A beautiful figure that tries to summarize all that's happening in trade flow in the world in 2014. So here we have a bunch of arrows. You can see the arrows represent the trade flows. The bigger the arrow, the larger the value of that trade flow. Question, what is the biggest trade flow in this figure? These are among the biggest. The biggest one is Europe. How do we know? Well, it's just a number. I didn't say that, but obviously there is a number associated with each arrow. And so I understand that this looks uh, as big, uh, but with a number, <laughs> the answer is there, right? Uh, so the biggest trade flow in the world is between Europe and itself. But when you look at this figure, the second biggest number, if I'm not mistaken, is between China and other Asia and itself. And uh, yeah, and then we have these two things. But so, you know, also also look at look at the U.S. You see the U.S. trade with Europe, right? Four hundred, three hundred, lots with Asia, eight hundred. But there's a lot of you know, trade in the U.S. But also the U.S. in Canada and the U.S. in Central America, especially relative to the export that they have with the rest of the world. So what this is telling us is that international trade really is not really that international. I mean, international trade is mainly a regional thing, continental thing, if you like. Because most of trade that happens across countries happens within the same region. Europe trades most with itself. China and other Asia trades most with itself. There is also a ton of trade, especially for the size, in the US and Canada, within North America. And, you know, here we have the US. If we had the figure of the US with itself, we have a larger number, right? So that's a very important message. Most of the international trade is a regional thing. And what is the second message? Well, Asia is really at the center of this international trade, despite the figure it's in the middle. Right? Because the biggest flows between regions are China and Canada, 800 billions, and uh, Europe and Asia, and one trillion. Now let's look at trade relative to GDP. We saw before, at the very beginning of this lecture, figure of trade relative to GDP for Denmark. We saw the export, Danish exports and Danish imports were roughly 50% of GDP. Here we have uh, these ratios for some you know, ridiculous countries like Hong Kong and Singapore, which you know are predominantly like uh, entrepots or stuff comes in just to get out exported somewhere else. Look at that, Hungary 85%. So Hungary is a super open economy. Sweden 57% just as open as Denmark, who's at 51%. So you see there's a lot of variation in the share across countries. But let me ask you something. So are you surprised by, by something here? Because when I look at this figure, I see, okay, you know, Thailand is very open, okay, Hungary is very open, Sweden very open, Denmark very open, okay, that makes sense. But then look at you know China here or the United States or Japan and I see these such small numbers. Is that surprising? Look more broadly here. What countries do you have here on this part of the graph? And which country on this part of the table? And which countries do you have on this part of the table? What is the main difference between Brazil, US, Japan, China, Indonesia, India, and Thailand, Hungary, Malaysia, Switzerland, Sweden, size and population. Right? So, you know, we have to multiply the share with the GDP to see who's actually trading the most. I right? presume that in terms of export value, trade value, China, Japan, and the US has larger values than these countries combined. 
But so here what we see is that larger economies look less open than the smaller economies. And that makes perfect sense, not only because these countries may have uh, incentives to be more self-sufficient, but you know, we're gonna see that this is actually something that comes straight from economics. Because countries trade a lot with countries that are large. So a large country trades a lot with itself. And basically here you can think, you know, if Denmark entered the European Union market, no, Denmark has very little to offer in terms of sheer volume, right? A lot to gain from the European Union. And so Denmark is going to be very open to trade. But the European Union itself, made of these many Denmarks, is going to look very self-sufficient because they trade a lot with one another and each small country is producing a particular type of good. So this is the type of thing that we're going to uh, uh, look at in this course. 